Today, I'll be looking at the design of a trading strategy to help compare whether the stochastic RSI indicator performs better than the standard RSI. Back after this brief message. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. As a trader, you'll benefit from cost-effective market access via multiple trading platforms and APIs. These enable trading and investing in any US stock, over 60 of the most liquid futures contracts, FX and CFDs. You can even diversify your portfolio by buying and selling other traders' strategies as investable assets themselves. So, if all of that sounds interesting, Learn more by clicking on the link top right now or find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. Whenever comparing indicators, it's important to follow a process that isn't unfairly biased towards the characteristics of one of the indicators. Today I start to design an overbought, oversold strategy using the stochastic RSI and the standard RSI indicators. Now, the design of this strategy is part of what I'm calling the Spotlight on Indicator series. And the reason I'm designing them is so that I can compare the stochastic RSI with the standard RSI when used as part of a real trading strategy. And last time I introduced you to the specific stochastic RSI indicator that I'll be using that you can see in the bottom of the screen here. And we compared previously the characteristics of that with the standard RSI that you see in blue. Now, because those characteristics are different, we have to take those differences into consideration so that we are fairly comparing one indicator with the other. So as an example, because the stochastic RSI tends to have much larger swings, the values of 80 and 20 for the overbought and oversold regions seems to make sense for this indicator. However, if we used those same values for the RSI, we'd have hardly any overbought, oversold signals at all. And so, although I'll be using those values for the stochastic RSI, I will be using less extreme values for RSI, and probably, as a starting point, that will be 70 and 30. Now, I don't doubt that I will still get far fewer trades from the RSI strategy than I do from the stochastic RSI but I will not be reducing these values in order to get a comparable number of trades. That doesn't make sense. The whole purpose of the stochastic RSI is that it gets around that issue. And so it's right that we keep these levels at values that won't produce as many trades. So it is a bit of a balancing act here. But basically, I'll be using 80 and 20 for stock RSI and 70 and 30 for RSI. But what I will keep consistent is the value of 14 for the RSI periods. So I'll be using 14 for the standard RSI, but also 14 for the RSI component of the stock RSI. So the stochastic calculation will effectively be undertaken on these blue values that you see here. And I think it's only right that we keep that at the same value. Now, something else that I might have to do is to use different filters for each of these indicators based on some of their characteristics. So if I just come over for some price action that illustrates this, you'll see that we have on the right hand side here quite a volatile example of price action, whereas on the left, volatility is much less. Now, for the RSI indicator, because this is calculated directly from the price action, this can take account of this volatility quite well, and this is definitely an advantage for the RSI indicator. So what you see here is that while we get these large swings, the RSI does go from the oversold region to the overbought region, 
back to the oversold region. Whereas when the volatility is much less, like we can see on the left here, the RSI, broadly speaking, stays in the neutral zone here. And so the RSI itself takes account of that volatility and it would keep you out of the market when the volatility was lower. And why is this important? Well, if volatility is low like this, then although you could on paper possibly make a profit from trading these swings, in reality, transaction costs would probably outweigh any profit that you made. But if we take a look at the stochastic RSI, this does continually throughout this period give us oversold and overbought signals. Now, when volatility is higher, that's great. But when it's lower, we might need to do something to keep our trading strategy out of the market when volatility is below a certain threshold. And so because of that, with the stochastic RSI strategy, I may use a volatility filter, something like the average true range, with a threshold that allows trades to be executed on signals when volatility is above that threshold and stops them from opening when it is below. I'll also be looking at trend filters so that we can see what the performance of both of these are in both trending environments and also ranging markets because it may well be that we can only trade these overbought oversold signals in certain types of market regime. Now as I go through the analysis there may be other examples but I'll always incorporate those based on what makes most sense because of the results we're getting. Now in terms of signals themselves we have a number of options. We can invoke an overbought signal when the indicator goes into the overbought region, so this point here. We could alternatively initiate the signal when the indicator leaves the overbought region. The other option is that we do it based on a turn in the indicator while it's in this region, which for this one and this one and this one would be fine. For this one, it would cause us to enter earlier before the indicator went further up. And so we'd have to decide what the rule would be when that happened. But I'll be trying all of these options to see which one tends to work best. And I'll be doing that for both RSI and the stochastic RSI. So in summary, we need to make sure that we're comparing the stock RSI with the RSI in as fair a way as possible so as not to bias our results. When we can keep things consistent between the two, then I will. So for example, the 14 periods that we're going to use for the RSI calculations. Obviously, we can use a different parameter for the number of periods of the stochastic calculation, and I'm going to use a value of 10 here. Predominantly because this is what Perry Kaufman suggests in his book, so it seems like a good starting point for this piece of work. But when it doesn't make sense to have the same values between the two indicators, we will be changing those. So an example of that is the threshold levels for the classification of the price action being overbought and oversold. And as discussed, these are the values that I'm going to use. And of course, there might also have to be differences in the use of filters based on the individual characteristics of the two indicators. So in the next episode, I'm going to be looking at a different strategy, but still keeping to our two indicators, this time based on divergences between price action and the indicators themselves. And then it starts to get really interesting because we start the analysis and start to look at some of the results that we can achieve from the indicators. If you think you have any relevant information, hints or tips about the topic of any of my videos, then please remember to comment so that I and other viewers can all benefit from your insights. Also, if you're getting value from this video, then please remember to give me a thumbs up. Now, until next time, trade safe.